Here is one of a series of talks by spiritual leader Lola McDowell Lee, spanning two decades from the early 70s through the 90s. Lola was a Zen Roshi, whose Rinzai lineage included Dr. Henry Plutov and renowned Zen master Shigetsu Sasaki. Lola was a religious scholar as well as an ordained Christian minister. While the talks are focused mainly on Zen and Buddhism, Lola drew on many spiritual traditions, including those of Jesus, Plato, Lao Tzu, the Hindu Vedas, Meister Eckhart, and Gurdjieff. Of heaven or hell, we have no recollection, no knowledge. We must become what we were before we were born. Rain, hail, snow and ice are divided from one another. But after they fall, they are the same water of the stream in the valley. Should we seek the way of the Buddha? All night long, searching, you will enter your own mind. When they ask you, where is your country? What is your native place? Answer, I am a man of original inactivity. The figure of the real man standing there just a glimpse of him, and we are in love. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, last Sunday, you know, I did mention a ladder, and it's a ladder that we use, <coughs> we think, to climb to success. <laughs> success. Now, this ladder on which you climb to success is one that you carry around with you. Hmm. And uh, so that carrying it with you wherever you go, wherever you can find a place, you simply fix the ladder and then you start climbing. Hmm. And this ladder, of course, is non-ending. There is never a finish to it. You know, you think, I'm going to reach to that place, and when you reach to that place, why, already it's got five places more that you can reach. So you got the rung after rung after rung after rung, you know, of this cotton picking ladder that you've got in there, in here someplace. Look, you know. Hmm? The mind just simply goes on projecting new rungs. Yeah. And the whole thing boils down to an ego game. Yeah. And you're, you know, you run around this world and you constantly asking yourself, you know, where is the rung on which I'm standing? What, what is this rung on which I'm standing so I can reach to the next one? What is this rung? Is it important enough for people to pay attention to me? You know, this rung on which I'm standing. Huh? Where am I in this whole hierarchy? Yeah. Now, the realization of yourself, what you truly are, huh? which is called enlightenment, yeah? is just simply getting off the ladder and never asking for any ladder ever again. So, I expect to see a nice pile of kindling wood out there after class. Hmm? Of heaven or hell, we have no recollection, no knowledge. We must become what we were before we were born. Now, in this world in which we find ourselves, we find that everything returns to its source. It's what one could call it a law of nature. Law of nature simply being the way it is, the way it functions. Everything returns to its source. And now, 
human beings, huh? men and women, individuals, conscious states, hmm? return to the source consciously. Shouldn't they? Huh? Huh? Knowing, you know, that you are conscious and knowing what this... Oh, you cannot say that. Knowing consciousness, hmm? You can know the source of the consciousness, huh? Yeah. And so one could say in a way you would know the goal. Because the goal is the source. This is extremely fundamental. It's very basic. You will return to your source. And it behooves you, you, it behooves you to return consciously. Otherwise, you will return unconsciously. It behooves you to return consciously. This is fundamental. And once you get it under your belt, and the matter, you know, even if just, you know, get a mental glimpse of this, you know, then you can drop your ladders. You can drop your gold. You know, you know and we do remember that Jesus did say to his disciples when they asked him, when will we know the end? And this very remarkable man said to them, you will know the end when you know the beginning. Hmm? Now, of course, uh, finding ourselves in this phenomenal world, in this world, and uh, how it operates and so on, and uh, we realize that we must earn a living, hmm? and so that uh, we, you know, we're selling millet, selling grain in the marketplace. Hmm? You can become a doctor or a lawyer or a scientist, or a poet, or an artist, or an Indian chief. However, huh? Yeah. Now, these goals are in a phenomenal world. And here's where you learn to use the ladder. Hmm? And it is in this phenomenal world that it is through this phenomenal world. You know, this world of things and objects. This world of things and objects, hmm? This world of things and objects that we have abstracted from out there, huh? It is through this world that we can know ourselves, huh? Yeah? Without this world, we would never, ever know that we existed. Never. You know. Consciousness rises through contact. Hmm? However, now, the consciousness has a made contact. You know a world. You know things and objects. You know that you are conscious. What now? What now? What are you going to do with it? Build some more ladders? Hmm? What are you going to do with this consciousness that is now sitting here waiting for you to do something? Hmm? Yeah. Well, you know, we have natural inclinations, and we move in the direction of natural inclinations. You know, there's the old saying, as the twig is bent, so grows the tree. Hmm? And so we move in these outer directions to do this, that, or the other. But where is the innocence with which you were born? Where is it? Hmm? We hear this term, enlightenment, 
And we put it now in the same category, you know, as becoming a doctor or a lawyer or an Indian chief. Hmm? Don't do that to yourself. Hmm? One becomes enlightened when one has returned to the original. You know, there's so much malarkey round and about as to how to do this thing and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. It's really very simple. Hmm? You return to yourself. Everything returns to its roots, to its seed, huh? And in between, ha-ha, you know, the going out and the return, we invent all kinds of things. You would be surprised what you carry in your mind, you know, how much of it is invented, inventions by man. You know, the mind, hmm? Yeah. In between the going out and the coming in, heaven and hell are invented as arbitrary goals. Yeah. As far as uh, heaven in the sky is concerned, people in this country, people in Europe, people in the Far East, in the Orient, lots of people, millions of people believe that heaven is in the sky. This they believe, sincerely. Do you know, I mean, do you know of your own experience that it exists? Hmm? Well, we've been told heaven is within you. Hmm? If it's within you, how could it be in the sky? Hmm? And now, do you know that there is a hell to which you're going to reside someday? There's a, you know, you've heard of Rabia. I mention her from time to time. She's a Sufi. She was one of the founders of the, of the Sufi tradition. Very great teacher she was. Very rarely do you hear anything about women in any tradition, but here's one, Rabia. One day, she was running around the marketplace, and in one hand, she was carrying a pot of water, and in the other hand, she had this burning torch, and she's going like crazy around this marketplace, you know. And people began to gather to watch her, you know, and very puzzled. What is this woman doing, you know? So someone finally got up enough courage to ask, you know, where are you going with a pot of water and a torch? And she said, I want to drown hell with the water and burn your heaven with the torch. Huh? Unless they are done away with, man will never know what religion is. Huh? To even know what religion is with all your knowing. Huh? Whatever man thinks is, is needed at a particular time, in a particular country, Somebody is there to think it up to provide it for everybody else. Hmm? Yeah. Now, in India, uh, the Indian heaven is quite cool. Of course, you know, it's very hot in India. So to get out of the heat, their heaven is, is, is comfortable, you know. It's all constantly in the Indian heaven. 24 hours a day, a nice cool breeze blows. The sun rises, but it's not hot, you know. Heaven is air-conditioned. Yeah? Right. And, of course, their hell is all fire. You know. Now, the Tibetan hell is very different than the Indian hell. Yeah? It's a different country, and it has a different climate, so fire is not allowed in a Tibetan hell. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Hell is snow, and the more snow, and the more snow, and more snow. Eternal snow. You are buried in snow. What else, huh? Now, if there really is such a place as this, as hell, how is it that it is different with all these different people? Hmm? 
Yeah. You know, and it's true, like this, this man, he was an Indian also, East Indian, and um, he died, and he, he reached this place, and big sign on, this is hell, you know? And he was very surprised, because after all, who believes they're going to hell? Nobody. Huh? No, of course not. You don't believe it. You may believe hell is, but you're sure not going to be one of those that go there. It's in, Why? That's incredible. There's a little fear that I might, but no, you know, it's not going to happen to me, you know. But anyway, from this land of religious Mahatmas, where nobody is going to hell because all these nice gurus are washing all over everybody so that nothing has to have going to hell, it's impossible. Huh? However, now this man finds himself there, and he thinks, well, something has just gone wrong, some kind of red tape or something. Some minor official has made a mistake. Yeah? So he inquired at the gate, you know, what's the matter here? And the man looked at the papers, and you know, at the gate, and he said to him, there's nothing wrong. You have been brought to the place where you belong. And he says, now you are here. Now you have a choice. Which hell would you like to have? Hmm? And the Indian was rather surprised. He never thought about this. Now, which hell? Are there other hells in the Indian hell? Oh, of course there are other hells. There are many. You can have a German hell. You can have the Italian. You can have the Indian. You can have the Japanese. Which hell do you want? And the man was very puzzled, you know. He says, I never thought about this. What's the difference? Hmm? What's the difference between, the, for instance, the Indian hell and the German hell? Well, on the surface, there's no difference. The fire is the same, the burning is the same, you know, and all that. The, well, then, why do you tell me to choose? Well, there is a subtle difference, very subtle difference. In the German hell, things are done with German efficiency. See? And, of course, in the Indian hell, things are done with Indian incompetence. And I use that word in rather than the word that's supposed to be used in there. <laughs> yep. Now, which would you choose? The efficient hell or the incompetent hell? Which would you choose? Hmm? Supposing it were you that were standing there and you've got this choice to make now, which one are you going to choose? Choose one or the other. And it should surely tell you something about yourself. Huh. Yeah. So, you know, that's hell. Now, heaven, you know, many kinds of heaven, you know, all different. Whatever people have asked for, you know, has been provided. Let's see, where is it? There's one country over there. Is it Persia? That when you die, why, the man, the man, you know, heaven is for men over there. <laughs> yeah, you die, the man dies, and he is automatically provided with a 1,000 huris. Hmm? Yeah. And then in the, there is a Mohammedan heaven where homosexuality is provided for. Shocking. In the Puritan heaven, of course, it's verboten, and that's how we've been brought up. But homosexuality is provided in that country because it is prevalent and it is accepted. So, these are your just rewards. Hmm? Whatever you like, that's what's given. Hmm? So, this man is saying of heaven and hell we have no recollection and no knowledge that these are notions that we have abstracted. Huh? You have abstracted them from what? Hmm? From the whence cometh your notions? <clears throat> the EQ is the one who wrote this, you know. Heaven and hell. What heaven? What hell? No. Denies any ray reality to either. You have no knowledge of it. You know? 
You have no recollection of it? You don't know that it is. No. But because he said such a thing, there was a tremendous amount of anger projected at this man. You know, you do not take away people's heaven. You do not take away people's hell. That's a no, 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 no. But here and here he is saying, you know, no heaven, no hell, no punishment, no reward in the afterlife. Hmm? And he indicates in there, very subtly, he points the finger, that each act, each act, hmm, has its own punishment and its own reward. It's intrinsic in the act. It's intrinsic in you. Have you ever thought about what kind of rewards you do want and what they really are and how they affect you? This wanting of this reward or, or this looking for the punishment? Do you, do, do you see a little bit what you're doing to yourself? Yeah. You know, when you're angry, you know, you punish yourself in your anger. When you are loving, you know, in that loving act there is a reward. It is the love itself, the act of love, that is a reward. What more do you want? Hmm? There's nobody keeping accounts, you know. There's nobody writing down what you're doing. You, you know, be it good or be it bad, you know, every moment. Each act is its own reward. And then we run around doing all kinds of silly things. You won't know, be punished. You know, if you help someone, all of a sudden there's such a joy rising until the ego gets a hold of it. Hmm? And then you begin to look for praise for your joy. Hmm? And then you begin to praise yourself for what you've done. Yeah? And the joy is all gone. You know? The, the, just that little moment of accepting the joy, it's all dispersed now. Just hold with that moment of, of accepting the joy. Just hold with it. It is such a reward. Yeah. Of heaven or hell, we have no recollection. Now, if you will go down into your own nature, into your own roots, which, believe it or not, is really easier than trying to find some goal, you know, climbing a ladder to a goal, huh? Because the goal, of course, is, is out there, and it's difficult, and, and of course, Thinking about this goal that you're going to achieve is all imaginary. Uh, you know, I'd like to see you... <laughs> well, anyway. Thinking about the goal is imaginary. The goal is imaginary. You've never been to your goal, have you? In this imaginary goal? Have you ever really been there? No? Yeah? You know, this manufacturing business. How will you ever arrive... That's something you have manufactured, except in your own imagination. Hmm? What truth is there in that? You manufacture something and go after it hard enough and long enough, and you wind up in a honey farm, realizing it. Huh? So you take a very pragmatic attitude. Don't bother about the goal. Huh? How can you? You don't know anything about it. Huh? When you're worried about the goal that is the top rung of the ladder, that's in the future. You don't know anything about that either. No. But you can go back into the source. Yeah? You have come from there. See? So, and it's a known. You know it. Believe it or not, you know it. Yeah? The roots are still with you. Those who have gone, you know, layer after layer after layer into themselves, they have touched that very ground. And in that ground, there is no hell and there is no heaven. In fact, you know, all the identities in which you are now caught, that dualistic you, you know, is not going to be present. But there is something that will be aware of the roots 
of the ground. Hmm? Yeah. It's a non-dualistic, non-discriminative state. Huh? And if you understand this through meditation, through your own inner search, then you will never, ever choose any artificial goal. You just couldn't, you know? So you just start relaxing into nature, and you become the original. Huh? And in the ordinary naturalness comes about enlightenment. Hmm? Now, rain, hail, snow, and ice are divided from one another. All divided from one another, huh? Huh? But after they fall, they are the same water of the stream in the valley. Yeah. Water can be frozen. Water can flow. Water can evaporate and become the clouds. Hmm? But it's the same water. From one substance, from one substance, trees rise, the animals manifest, men and women make an appearance. The, these are manifestations or appearances, huh? And the distinctions that we make are relative. Hmm? They are never absolute. They are relative. When we disappear, hmm, we go again into a cosmic oneness or the absolute. Huh? Why not know it beforehand? Hmm. Why not? Huh? You know, this man, the Buddha, <coughs> to my knowledge, didn't use the word God. No. He used words such as everlasting light. He used words such as shunyata. Uh, God had become, the word God had become associated with many erroneous ideas. So shunyata. And Nagarjuna was the one, of course, that developed that even further. Shunyata is translated as nothing, as emptiness as a void. <coughs> hmm? How can you talk to a void? Hmm? How can you talk about a void? <coughs> hmm? What can you say about a void? What can you say about emptiness? How can you talk about it? I expect you to show it to me, but how can you talk about it? Yeah. There's a beauty in the word. Because you can't talk about it. You use the word shunyata and it cuts right down to the very roots. Just cuts it all off, huh? So it creates a deeper understanding of what this that we call life is all about. Hmm? There is the falling into the silence and observing without discrimination. Observing without distinction is difficult because I see that you hardly can observe with it all the rest of it. Anyway, all is shunyata. Yeah. And it's a word that is so misunderstood. It is vibrant with all possibilities, with all potentials. It's empty. When we fall back, hmm? when we fall back, you know, we're in nature. In the beginning is this shunyata, 
this true nature? In the end, is this shunyata, this true nature? Why in the middle do we make such a fuss? Huh? Why on your way from beginning to beginning, so much worry, so much anxiety? Hmm? No. Beginning to beginning, that's the way. That's the trip you're on. And just so you know a little bit about mm -hmm, where about you're at in it. Long, long time ago, there was a story. In a, in a cold night, you know, in a cold winter night. It was a dark night. It was a dark night. And the bird came into the window of a palace, king's palace, you know, through a window. And it fluttered around the room and uh, feels the coziness of the room, of this king's palace, you know, becomes aware of the light in the room and the warmth. Hmm? And it sees and it knows and then flies out the window again. Mm-hmm. That's us. Hmm? We have come in, you know, we have become acquainted with the phenomena, and therefore we know that we exist. We know the light and the warmth and the coziness and the anguish and the misery and the greed. Huh? And then we fly out the window again. We have such an obsession with uh, this that's in the room. Huh? When you fly out of the window, now we're about to yak. Huh? It behooves you to find out. You know, uh, you know, like uh, Kusan being here, you know, he, he considers himself a very ordinary man. Hmm? A Zen monk, just a monk, you know, is, is the most ordinary man in the world. You know? Chopping wood, working in the field, carrying water from the well. And he says, how marvelous, how marvelous, how wondrous. And he continues to do all the things that are necessary, that are necessary. The beauty of it, chopping wood, carrying water, painting, the beauty of it, the wondrousness of it. Huh? Who? You know, there was once a monk, he was working very, very hard out in the fields, and he was, you know, chopping the weeds and, you know, growing the food. And somebody came by and asked him why he worked so hard. And he says, I'm doing it for someone. Well, why doesn't that someone do it for himself? He cannot. He has no hands or feet. So I do it for him. I cannot do it without him. Carrying water, chopping wood, walking, eating, sitting. I do it for him. <coughs> what do you think you're carrying around inside? Hmm? There was once a man who went to see Ramana Maharshi. Now, Ramana Maharshi was an authentic teacher. Very real, very good. <laughs> Enlightened. Yeah. Now this man, when he got to Ramana Maharshi's place, he saw that Ramana Maharshi was sitting there chopping vegetables. And this turned him off. You know, he probably thought he'd see this man sitting on some golden throne in the robes and, you know, <laughs> you know, the notions that we get. Yeah. He wanted something extraordinary. And this man is just this, this marvelous, well-known teacher, you know, just sitting there chopping vegetables. You know, 
So being so disconcerted, he went back to his hotel, and he waited around and poked around in the town and everything, and after a few weeks, he decided he'd go back once more and see what was happening now. Maybe he had made a mistake, you know. So he gets to Maharshi's place, and there he's sitting there telling jokes. Hmm? And that just finished the man, you know. He's very ordinary. Look at him, telling jokes. Nothing extraordinary about him. So this man went in search of another teacher. And, of course, he found one. They're very easy to find, you know. And he practiced with him for many, many years. Say, like ten years. He really, and he put his all into it, you know. And then after all those years, all of a sudden, he found out that that teacher was a pretender. I mean, he even pretended to himself that he knew, you know. But, you know, one could say, but there is some good that comes out of it. Maybe now, huh, he could understand and would maybe accept a Maharshi, you know, chopping vegetables and telling jokes. Yeah? You know, we have this peculiar thing called an ego. Hmm? Have you ever seen it? Well, a lot of people haven't, you know. If you have, it's pretty good. Huh? But the, the ego, you know, is, is always searching for something bigger. Something bigger. <laughs> yeah. Bigger, bigger, bigger ego is what it's searching for, huh? Really. Yeah? And now, uh, the, the true man, you know, doesn't have this kind of an ego. You know? He's an ordinary man. Very ordinary. He's so ordinary that he's extraordinary. Yeah. Should you seek the way of the Buddha all night long, searching, you will enter your own mind. Well, that's our conditioning, huh? We look out there. After all, the world is out there. And we are interested in objects out there. We're not realizing that the objects are also in here. Hmm? So outside world is very intriguing. It's a wondrous world out there. And it is. It's a wondrous world we live in. And it is worth exploring. All the things that have manifest, regardless of how we may see them through our senses, Still, that there we can observe the many shades of green and the many shades of brown. Hmm? That we can see one another. You know, it's a wondrous world we live in. Yeah, all this manifest that, that is manifested from something, huh? and we should explore it. Yeah, but when it comes to religion. You know, finding a way to Christ or finding a way to Buddha or to Lao Tzu. We are so conditioned to looking out there. We don't drop it. It takes a long time to get over that conditioning of looking out there. A long, long time. You think you're over it, and then all of a sudden one day you discover you're not. Because, you know, you, you look at this and you say... Oh, it must be in here. Huh? I look at a rose and it must be in here. I read a book and oh, it must be in here. You know, we're always looking for it outside. And then we, we plunk ourselves down on a pillow and all of a sudden we say, Oh, look at the light. Shall I tell you something? That's still outside. Hmm? Seeking outside is going further and further and further away from the source. Yep. And if you seek in that way, out and out and out and out, you can seek all night long, all of this short, dark night that we have got. Huh? You will not find anything except this one truth. And if you stumble on it, you're very fortunate. Huh? Searching. You will enter your own mind.
If you can find this one thing, searching, you will stumble upon your own mind. If you can find that one thing in the middle of all of these frustrations, hmm, that what you're searching for is not outside. And then as you penetrate deeper within your own mind, you will move from mind to what is called no mind. The superficial layers of mind to the inner content of no mind. That's the way. Yeah? When you first turn within, you see all the thoughts and the desires and the fantasies and the hallucinations, the imagination and the memory. But if you go on penetrating, you will come to silence. And it is just not quiet. You know, quiet is quiet. That's fine. But silence, silence is like a thoughtless space. Hmm? And you slip from time into the timeless. When there is no time, when there is only this silence, when there is this non-discrimination, when there is a non-ego, when there is a non-dual, hmm? the non-dualistic state, yeah? then you got your toe in the water. Yeah? But this arriving to the place where you have got your toe in the water huh, is a return to yourself, to your own nature. You have not arrived at something new, some kind of goal that you put out there. You have arrived at that which already is. Hmm? It has always been. It will always be. With what are you sitting there? Hmm? When they ask you, you know, where is your country? What is your native place? Answer, I am a man of original inactivity. Okay, arriving, arriving. You got your toe in the water, arriving. There's something is in here, and now you know something is in here. Now you understand there was no need to do anything at all. Up until that time, you didn't understand it. You know, you got to do. Now you understand that all is just happening. The world is running smoothly. The world is running so beautifully. The world is running so perfectly. <laughs> it is, you know. But we think we're separate from it. We think it ought to run a little bit different. Huh? And so now because of all of this, we think it should be different. And we don't think it's perfect, you know. And now all comes our problems. Yeah. Now, if one will really go deep enough within, the separation disappears. Yeah? Uh, egolessness arises. Yeah? Ego simply means separation. And if you find your ego, you will see why. Hmm? You know, you can't fight this ego and have it disappear. You have to understand it. Yeah. Ego claims. Ego is greedy. Egolessness, that's security. Huh? Actually, there is no insecurity and there is no security. Because all the dualities have disappeared. You would never even think or feel insecurity with your toe in the water. Huh? You couldn't. But so you've got your toe in the water. Everybody can imagine themselves with a toe in the water. It doesn't mean that you are nothing, you know, that you do nothing. Hmm? 
even though, you know, you recognize that there could be an emptiness, maybe, and uh, you either got to do something about it or you're going to do nothing about it. There is all this happening. You know, I'm speaking. You're listening. These are doings. Hmm? Who's listening? Who's listening? Now where is the doer? When you walk, who does the walking? When you're eating, who is doing the eating? Eating is happening. Walking is happening. Talking is happening. Listening is happening. They're all together in this tremendous universe. Yeah? And we have so many notions, you know, about uh, what we, how we should act and how what we should not act and, you know. <laughs> and, of course, it is in Zen, it is a tradition that <clears throat> one doesn't cry. There is, you know, you know, they think they have overcome their emotions. <clears throat> Let me say that as long as you're a human being, you have emotions. You have feelings. It's part of what makes you a human being. You don't want to be a human being? Don't have emotions. All right with me. You know, anyway... But, you know, it's like when, when we left Shogenji, you know, Tani Roshi, he shouldn't have been doing this. It's not in the protocol. He's standing at the gate crying. Hmm? So, and it was like this, um, there, there was an um, old master. He died. Huh? Now, and his chief disciple was also known as an enlightened man, you know. And this chief disciple started to cry. And a lot of people had gathered around, you know, and they said, well, this is shocking. This man is enlightened. Why is he crying? You know. I mean, because of this disciple, this old master had become very famous. You know, the old master had been a man of very few words, you were a silent type of a man. But this disciple, he had had the charisma. He had had the magnetism. And through him, this old master had become very well known. You see, he had given it all to his old master. Hmm? Yeah. And now this disciple's crying. And he knew so much. He could give so much. No, this isn't right. So they said to him, you know, please don't cry. What will people think? Hmm? Yeah. yeah, people are coming from all over the country to give this old master his last send-off, his last farewell. And seeing you, an enlightened person, crying will have a very bad effect. Yeah. And this disciple said, what can I do? Tears are coming. Huh? When laughter comes, I laugh. Huh? When tears come, tears come. Yeah. When it happens, it happens. You know? You know, look at some of the layers that we put upon ourselves. That we mustn't do this and mustn't do that and mustn't do the other thing. Yeah? May not be natural to ourselves at all. Hmm? Maharshi chopped vegetables. The disciple cried. Hotai laughed. Ice melting. Rivers running, sun rising, eating, sleeping, hungry. That's natural. But I'm going to bear it all with this, you know. It may not be natural at all. It may be rather artificial. Huh? Yeah. Now and then, you know, what would be very nice would be <clears throat> to observe the sun rising or the sun setting. Here, you know, when there's lots of moisture in the air, Sunsets are very lovely. Hmm? 
maybe as you stand there and you're sitting there and you look at it and you're observing it and you're observing yourself, observing... <laughs> yeah? Just observe. You lose track of yourself. Huh? And that's so marvelous. You know, for a little moment, just to forget yourself. Yeah. Immediately there's a beauty. Immediately. Huh? The beauty doesn't rise out of the sun. No. It rises because you forgot yourself. Hmm? And then the whole world is like a benediction. Hmm? The forgetting of yourself. You find the original inactivity. Hmm? The original inactivity. Let this be your land. Hmm? This is where you belong. This is from whence you have come. This is where you should relax and be. Yeah. And then there is the real man. Just a glimpse. And we're in love. Well. It comes about and one... No, I'm in love with myself. I'm in love with myself. I'm in love with myself. But not this self. But there is a self. Just a glimpse, and we are in love. It is true. Just a glimpse, and we are in love. Hmm? And what this old millet vendor said, you know, when the, when the man, when Tokusan told him how remarkable it was, and he said, and in all of China, there is none else but I. That also comes. You know, the way we have lived, first comes the natural, then we have layered on the society, and this, this artificiality, you know. Do you know that it takes a lot of effort to remain artificial? Hmm? It's a constant working at it. Yeah? It's pushing the river. And the old Sam saying is, don't push the river. No. They're all washed out. Pushing the river. Yeah. And this original in you, your land, you know, it's always waiting for you to look back at it. Just a glimpse, and the aggressiveness disappears. A glimpse, and we're in love. Yeah. What do you call that? What do you call that? What do you call that? <laughs> but what does the smelling of the flowers do for me? If you smelled the flowers, what would it do for you? Same thing that it would for me, you know. Not different. Well, then you think about it for a while. May the peace and the power that passeth all understanding hold us and keep us in the love of the Christ in consciousness while we are seemingly separate one from another. And I thank you very much.
If you find Lola's talks valuable, more will be posted in weeks to come.